Hey, you can take a seat, and uh, I'm going to encourage you to grab your Bibles or your Bible apps and turn to the book of Matthew chapter 5. Matthew 5 is our text. If uh, you don't have a Bible with you or a Bible app on your device, that's fine. If you're in the room here at Sweetwater, grab a Bible in the seats around you. Turn to page 962. And you will find Matthew chapter 5. You'll be able to follow along with us. If you're at our Parker campus, then uh, there's a table right in the back. And you can just get up right now and go grab a Bible and turn to page 962. And you'll be able to follow along as well. And as always, if you're at any of our campuses uh, and you need a Bible, then please take one. We want you to have God's Word and read God's Word. If you're joining us online and you don't have a Bible and you want one, then uh, by all means, ask and we will get you a Bible, whether we mail that to you or deliver it to you. We want everyone to have God's Word and read God's Word because we know if you read and apply God's Word, God will change your life. Hey, uh, today we are wrapping up our Good Life series and we're looking at the most difficult beatitude uh, to really embrace. And and to help teach this challenging truth, uh, allow me to introduce uh, John Dinah. Uh, He is a missionary, uh, one of our missionaries in serving in Kenya was in Mozambique for a long time. Uh, now he's in Kenya training missionaries that are coming to Africa. And, uh, and, and we help to support them. You may or may not know this, but uh, through uh, the International Mission Board of Southern Baptist, uh, we contribute to that, but we help support that. But as Calvary is a church, uh, we give 20% of our budget to missions. So last year, uh, in the budget and beyond the budget, we gave over $900,000 to mission causes. <laughs> You, you guys are pretty awesome. You guys are incredibly generous. That, that is, uh, I, I looked, looked up that number and I went, wow, that's really cool. And then, uh, by the way, about uh, half of that went to uh, Southern Baptist Causes, which also includes support for John and his wife, Vani, uh, in their missions endeavor. But, uh, and then in 2016, we started partnering with John and Vani in uh, Mozambique to, to drill water wells for people who don't have fresh, clean water. And uh, in, in the last year, Calvary gave 100, uh, over $100,000 to those water wells, just in, the, just in 2022. And, and, and here's the, the really cool part is uh, since 2016, we've funded construction for about 94 wells. And that, wait, wait, hold your, cla- hold your applause, because this is the cool part. This is even better, okay? The cool, this is the coolest part. That means that about 70,000 people a day are drinking clean, safe water because of you guys. See that? And I want you to realize, that's more than the combined populations of Parker and Lake Havasu. So we're, we're providing water for everyone who's a resident of Parker and Havasu in uh, Mozambique. So, John, it is great to have you with us. Yeah, thank you, Chad. And I want to extend a, a huge thank you, as Chad said, for your amazing <laughs> generosity. When we started this project, we did not know what God had in mind. And we just prayed. We just kept saying yes to God. And you know what? You guys kept saying yes to God. And when Chad shares those figures with you, I am here to attest, and he's come more than once, and he can attest to how it is to go out into a village that would not have access to clean water, to go there, to be able to share the gospel in that village, to get into a hole with somebody, working side by side and sharing your faith. And we're talking about, yeah, there's these believers back in the States who are really concerned about you having this water. And the reason they're concerned is because Christ changed their lives. We want to tell you about that. You talk about open ears. Talk about a village that's ready for you to come back. You all have made that possible. And I will tell you, I guess we're an example, Living Proof, we really can partner together to make mm-hmm. life change around the world because of the sake of Christ. So thank you very much for all of your sacrifice. Uh, that, you know, and, uh, and it is to, to be there, and I've shared uh, that at those experiences before, but uh, just thank you for for initiating that partnership, yeah. uh, you know, almost seven years ago when I said, hey, what can we do to bless people in Mozambique? He said, ah, drill a well. 93 wells later, yeah. uh, that's, uh, that's kind of cool. And we're not stopping. There's, there's, yeah, they're good. still doing wells as we speak. Hey, we're looking at the Beatitudes. We're wrapping it up. And uh, I challenge you at the beginning of this to memorize the Beatitudes. One Beatitude a week. You guys have got this down. I know you do. So uh, just say them with me if you, if you know them. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. And blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. 
Blessed are those who hunger and thirst after righteousness, for they shall be filled or satisfied. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall receive mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called sons of God. And blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. And blessed are you when men uh, say all manner of evil against you and, and, and slander you falsely for my sake. Rejoice and be glad, for in the same way they persecuted the prophets who were before you. Okay, Jesus said, blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness. I mean, I mean, that, I mean that, in a sense, that's crazy. You guys are listening, you're saying it with me, you're quoting it. But the path to the good life, according to Jesus, includes persecution. Let me say that again. The path to the good life. That's what we've been talking about. How to have that good life. And Jesus says, it involves being persecuted. And, and that really doesn't compute to our American ears. It doesn't uh, compute to my selfish, lazy ears. Okay, it really doesn't make any sense. So we want to discuss persecution with you. And, and, uh, and it just so happens that I'm sitting next to a person who has seen persecution. And, and that's the first point we want to make is persecution of Christians is a reality today. It, it happens today. So John, you've, you've served on the mission field over 30 years. You've You've been in war zones. Uh, actually, I, I, I don't tell him this, but he's the one I call that kind of the Indiana Jones of missionaries. So there was no holy grails involved, but there was lots of life change. So, uh, but uh, I mean, you've encountered persecution. You've witnessed it. You've you've dealt with uh, you know uh, nationals that have been persecuted and missionaries that were around persecution. Uh, just tell us a little bit about that. Okay. Well, I would say yes. In a word, yes. We've seen all of those things. And uh, I would just, to begin to answer your question, I would just begin with, you know, it all begins with life change in Christ. When Christ comes into our life, he changes us. He makes us different. He takes us out of the realm of darkness and puts us into a realm of light. He puts his love into our hearts. We actually start seeing people the way that God sees them. He indwells us with his Holy Spirit. So all of a sudden, we have this power to be able to obey and to follow and to do things otherwise would not be possible. God uses us as his witnesses, and we are able to share the gospel with other people. Uh, God uses us to worship together, and worship now becomes a part of our life. We long for times, personally and corporately, to worship together. Interestingly enough, we even come to the point of Christ that say, Father, let thy will be done, not my will be done. Okay, this is the change that happens. It's over these things that persecution comes. Yeah. That's, that's, the, that's the thing you don't realize. Doing those things is why persecution comes at you because now living within your community, uh, you're different. You actually have a faith that empowers you. You're not afraid of things as you used to be. Nobody's controlling you anymore because the, the Lamb of God is controlling you. And so then that creates persecution. And you just need to look at the life of Jesus to say, that's exactly right. Christ came, the Son of God. And what happened? He was crucified. Because people know how to do that. So I would just say in my life, yes. Um, mainly lying about me, spreading rumors about me, discrediting me, discrediting the message that I share. Because whenever the gospel goes into an area, there's people of power in that area, and the gospel changes that. And so people don't want the gospel going into those areas, so they discredit a messenger. In my life, it's been mainly that. I was introduced to this, Chad, for the first time, really, with a, a young guy named Baixinho. Baixinho, which means little guy, okay? Baixinho means a little person. And, uh, but he was a man of faith, and he took the gospel, and he opened a church in his village. Everything was great. They were preaching, and people were coming to faith. And then came a time in this area, of course, in Mozambique, very animistic, very community-minded. And, you know, you have a place when somebody dies, you have a cemetery, and in those villages, you have to keep the cemetery clean. You don't just do that. No, it's just not anyone who does that. So the chief organized that. Everybody comes in to clean the cemetery, including these new believers, the first-generation believers. When they come to the part of that cleaning, when they say, okay, now we need to worship those ancestors, we need to pay homage, we're going to do sacrifices to them, these new believers said, no, we cannot do that. 
We now follow Christ. He's our, he's our God. And let me tell you, persecution against those guys, they called Baishinho out, set him out in the middle, village now ostracizing because now, because they have not paid homage to these ancestors, now if anybody gets sick, if anybody is hit by a car, if something strange happens to somebody, we know it's because of you. And that creates immense pressure on people. And so I've just witnessed that. In Mozambique, we've seen, because of Islamic fundamentalists coming in, uh, 850,000 people displaced from one part of the country to another because of these radical beliefs. Mm -hmm. And we have believers who are involved, you know, in those areas having to flee uh, out of those areas. Of course, you see across Africa where one village even goes and attacks another village. And so that happened. So yes, uh, across Mozambique and across Africa, we see that persecution in many ways that come. You know, um, I was doing a little bit of research for this, knowing we're talking about persecution. According to a ministry called Open Doors, uh, it's a ministry that advocates for Christians facing persecution. These are their statistics for 2022. 360 million Christians worldwide face some kind of persecution or discrimination. 360 million. That means they live in countries or places where active persecution is not just allowed, but sometimes promoted by the government. Uh, so they documented, these are documented deaths. In other words, probably a whole lot more happened that were undocumented, but at least 5,800 Christians were killed last year because of their faith in Christ. Uh, plus churches were destroyed and closed. There was social ostracism, like you're talking about, losses of jobs and or finances. There was punishment or imprisonment without charges or just the charge of apostasy. Uh, on average, 13 Christians die each day from persecution. And that's just from persecution. That's not car accidents and, and other things. These are people who are being killed because they believe in Jesus. So mm -hmm. I want you to understand persecution is a reality. When Jesus said, blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness, uh, he was talking to people who are in that. And 360 million of our family members are facing it on a daily basis. So persecution is a reality. And persecution because of Jesus is a blessing. It's a blessing. I mean, that's what Jesus said. Blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. So that, that's where we kind of go, how can persecution be a blessing? Because most of us think of it in terms of a tragedy. We think of it in terms of this is something that's horrible. And, and, uh, and so we want to try to rescue people from persecution. Jesus said... You want the good life, then you got to embrace this idea of persecution being part of your life. So um, the first way that persecution can be a blessing, okay, because we're, we're all kind of going, how can this be? How does this really compute? The first way it can be a blessing is that persecution connects us to Jesus. It connects us to Jesus. Um, you know, Philippians chapter uh, 3, the Apostle Paul makes this declaration. I'm assuming that if you're a follower of Jesus, this is something that you take seriously too. Uh, by the way, if you're a follower of Christ, uh, it means that you believe that Jesus is the one and only Son of God, Savior of the world. You believe that Jesus died on the cross to pay for your sins. You believe that Jesus was raised from the dead and you've made a commitment to follow Jesus with your life. Uh, th this applies to you. So uh, if you're a follower of Jesus, this is what Paul modeled a prayer. He said, I want to know Christ. I want to know Christ. And I want to know the power of his resurrection. And I want to know the fellowship of sharing in his sufferings, being conformed to his death. That, that's Paul's prayer. I want to know Jesus, and I want to know his power, but I also want to share in his sufferings, and I want to be conformed to his death. Perfect obedience. Now, there's a part of this that means that if we really want to know Jesus, we need to be able to relate to or understand his sufferings, what he faced. Remember, Jesus said, the world hates you. Don't be surprised because they hated me first. So, uh, you know, persecution connects us to Jesus. John, mm -hmm. you've yeah. seen that. Well, per yes, I've seen that, experienced that. Persecution is very personal. It's very hard, and it's very refining. Nobody goes out and seeks persecution. Persecution comes to you. 
nor do we seek the suffering that comes with that persecution. What I have seen is in times of persecution, the way that God blesses you is he blesses you with his own presence. He blesses you with his, with the, his own presence to meet the persecution that is coming your way. Remember, God is sovereign, so he won't allow anything to come over you that he himself is not measuring. He measures his presence to you in the very same way for you to be able to withstand whatever it is that you're going through. So God's presence is ultimately the greatest blessing. But also, you just see that God gives us peace in persecution. And it doesn't make sense. It doesn't make sense, surely, to somebody who doesn't follow Christ. But in the midst of a storm, you will see people at peace. We hear in the Bible of peace that passes all understanding. That's what it's talking about. And that in those times, God is teaching you that he alone is enough. He is enough for you. He is enough for this time. God also uses those times so that we can ultimately come and realize that, that his blessing is this intimate fellowship with Christ. So that passage that you just read, now I am suffering as Christ suffered. And it just brings you into this fellowship with your Savior. It's an amazing process that happens. I think of it in times when I'm thinking of Paul and Silas. They come into an area, they heal a girl. After they heal her, they're thrown into jail. I'm summarizing quite a bit here. But they get thrown into jail. And so the Bible says that they are at midnight, chained up in a jail, doing what? Singing hymns to God in praise. So you think, these guys have just been beaten with rods, and they're now in jail, and as dark as can be, and it's probably wet and moldy and terrible. And what do they choose to do? They choose to sing and worship God. You know, I told you about this huge, massive movement of people in Mozambique because of these Islamic fundamentalists. I was up there not too long before I came. And while I was up there, we were ministering out in these camps of, of people. And you know, when you're talking with these people, they're just saying, you know, God has cursed us. I mean, look at what's happened. This is the curse of God. Now we've had to leave everything. We have to do this. And then you get time with a believer. And a believer says, you know, this has been so hard and God has blessed us so much. We thank God so much. He accompanied us. They're walking the same trails. They're escaping these dangers. But the perspective is completely different because of the abiding presence of God in a believer's life. Mm. That, uh, that is a, that's beautiful. But uh, Jesus said, in John chapter 16, he said, these things I have told you so that in me you may have peace. In the world you will have tribulation. Yeah. Isn't that a nice guarantee? <laughs> Jesus promised that you will have troubles. So if you're going, looking at God going, why? He's like, I told you. <laughs> in the world you'll have tribulation. But he says this, take courage, for I have overcome the world. So, I mean, we shouldn't be surprised, but, but in that midst of that persecution, it connects us to Jesus in a way that nothing else can. Uh, and, and I'm just going to say this, there's a blessing that a lot of us have missed out on because we haven't had to suffer in that way. Now, uh, persecution is a blessing because it connects us to Jesus. Persecution is also a blessing because persecution grows our faith. Grows our faith. Uh, Romans chapter 5, the Apostle Paul says some, you know, crazy things because he's, uh, you know, representing Jesus. And he says, we rejoice in our suffering Think about that. We rejoice. He's, he's the guy who got beaten with rods. He got whipped with, you know, uh, same lashes that Jesus took before the, persecu uh, before the crucifixion. Uh, he'd been imprisoned wrongly multiple times. He'd been shipwrecked. All these different things. He says, we rejoice in our suffering because suffering produces endurance. Mm -hmm. And endurance produces character. And character produces hope. And hope will not disappoint well, we all want to get to the hope part, don't we? We all want to get to the character part. Yeah, I like that. You only get there through suffering and through enduring that suffering. The Apostle James, you know, uh, put it this way. This is Jesus' half-brother. He said in chapter 1, he goes, Consider it all joy, my brothers, when you encounter various trials. Okay. He says it because the testing of your faith produces endurance. And endure, let endurance have its perfect result that you might be mature and complete, lacking nothing. 
Look, if we don't suffer, we're not going to grow. If we don't grow, we're not going to mature. If we don't mature, we're, we're, we're going to be always lacking something in our faith. So uh, persecution grows our faith. John, I'm, I'm sure you have seen that. You've experienced that. Uh, share with us some more about that. Yeah, you know, I'm thinking of a passage in the Scripture that says, without faith, it is impossible to please God. I think sometimes we look at our faith, but we've got to realize how much God values faith mm. and the powerful way that God sees that. Christian life is not a life of just coming to frequent a church, maybe go to a Bible study, and then you're done. It is a 24-7 life loving God more than anything. Right. Um, and so, you know, where I live in an animistic part of the world, it's very easy to say, I'm following Jesus. Because in that mindset, you're just adding Jesus to the other, the other spirits that you're following. You can just add him in. Well, I'm, and I'm sure you have things in the United States where you, you that compete with faith in the life of people. I'm sure that those are there. I'm not going to try to tell you what those are. I'm, you probably know what those are right now. Persecution purifies out your faith. It removes those things. It is the hard struggle because really in the midst of persecution, all you have is God. You have nothing else. And all those other things that you're leaning on, they're gone. One time I got a call, Chad, I was teaching it, one of the many things that you've come to help us teach. I got a call from a guy and he just said to me, he said, Pastor, my son has died. All that I have here is suffering. There's just sadness. That was it, that was the end of the call. I went, you know, I have all these guys that I'm teaching. I had, uh, you know, great disruption, but I really needed to go see this. This is terrible. I went, talked to the guys of the study. Everybody's like, yeah, you need to go. I gathered up some of those guys who lived near him that he knew. We drive, long drive out into a foresty area. It took us time to get out there. And as we come up, he's just leaning up against his hut, shirt half on, dust, dirt everywhere. Everyone around just wailing, which is normal. Okay, normal somewhat in Africa. As those guys, I don't think the wheels quit turning on that truck. When the guys that I brought out, they're out there, they're helping him, they're gathering him up, they're helping him, praying over him, reading scripture out in that place, building up faith. All this time we're building a casket over on this side for this young boy who died all in 24 hours. We go to the cemetery, bury this child, walking back, from that, having preached hope in Christ, each one of those men of God speaking at that time, as we're walking back, I'm walking with him. His name is Orlando. And Orlando says, you know, John, my dad died a couple of months ago and he fell down into a well, head first. And there was a lot of pressure on me to do ceremonies here to discover who made him fall in that well, and I would not do it. He said, but now with my son, the pressure is gonna be huge. But he said, I will withstand. I trust God. I will not. Now, you've got to realize this person grew up with a witch doctor dad and mom. Mm -hmm. He's left that for Christ. And now he is with resisting that, those items of pollution into pure faith. And let me just tell you, church, when somebody is going through a tsunami of persecution and of suffering, Think of the role that you have to play to come alongside somebody who's suffering. The role that you have to call, to go, to be in person, and walk together with them through this time because your faith is contagious. Mm. I think that word contagious, we all learned a little bit about that during uh, COVID. <laughs> you know what? There's something else that's contagious. It's faith in the Lord Jesus. Amen. It's faith to the Word of God. You can share God. God's faith, you can share the word of God. You can pray with people as they're walking through these times. I'm telling you, we rolled up on a man broken and leaned over, and we left a man standing straight up in the power of God because of that time. Amen. Yeah. Amen. That is awesome. You know, we all want to, our faith to grow. We all want our faith to be strong. We make those uh, statements all the time, and God hears our prayers, and he sends the trials. He sends the suffering. He allows the persecution because he wants to grow our faith. And then persecution can be a blessing, not only because it connects us to Jesus and grows our faith, but persecution demonstrates the power of the gospel. In Acts chapter 8, uh, the very beginning verse, it's right after uh, Stephen was stoned to death. And uh, it says that 
the persecution intensified. Saul was uh, part of that. And the church, except for the apostles, scattered. They were driven out of Jerusalem. Now, that sounds like a terrible thing, except everywhere those people went, the gospel went with them. So, so here's, again, some of the research I've done. The Gospel Coalition reports that in 2021, the fastest-growing churches in the world in Iran and Afghanistan. Yeah, Iran and Afghanistan. That's where the, that's where the church is growing the fastest in the world. It, it, by the way, uh, it's punishable by death to convert to Christianity. And, and the church is growing. Uh, the Center for a Study of Global Christianity comprised a list of 20 countries with the fastest Christian growth. And the list includes also China, Saudi Arabia, Qatar, Kuwait, uh, and many other countries where it's illegal to convert. See, that's what God is doing in the midst of persecution. Amen. So uh, God is able to use the, the, you know, the, the suffering of his people to do amazing things. And, and I know you've seen this. Yeah, 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 for sure. I, you know, it takes me back to a, a quote from the second century by a guy named Tertullian who said, the blood of the martyrs is the seed of the church. Now, that's a powerful quote. But why do you think he wrote that? From what experience did he gain that insight? Yeah. Blood of the Martyrs is our history. And in Mozambique, I have seen, of course, that process. And really what persecution does is it purifies your faith down. As your faith becomes purified down, then it identifies your purpose of why you're here. Really, you become very singular in your purpose. And if you, and if you talk with someone who has endured persecution, you're going to find they probably don't have a lot of time for peripheral things because their purpose has been so clear to them, that's what they march on. They march forward in that purpose. Our purpose is to glorify God in everything that we do. Our purpose is to be a witness of the Lord Jesus in every circumstance in life. Does this church ever say amen, Chad? <laughs> no, they clap. They, they you know, oh, do You know, they like to clap, <laughs> all right? We are God's witnesses. Yep. God is using our life as his witness as he works through this, even in times of persecution. Remember that story I told you about Baishinho and his village and they came under all this persecution? You know the result of that is? That church has planted now seven other churches. Amen. Right? See, there here, you go. See, they're clapping. That's here, the amen. There we go. That's the amen. <laughs> here goes a guy who's, who's identified, pulled out in the middle, accused, threatened his life. And now they just go on and they plant seven more who those churches then go and plant more. That's how we've seen great church growth. We see a, another guy that I know, lives up in the northern part of, of Mozambique, became a believer the moment he was baptized, his family discarded him, they sent him away. Don't I ever see you again, you're disowned, leave, all of that. He had to leave the town. When he left the town, he went to another city that was by so he could get a job and as he was working there, he kind of got into himself. He got a good job, he was working, you know? that entire family of his that kicked him out, they ended up having to flee for their lives. When they do, where do they go? They go to his house. When they go to his house, he receives them in with the love of God because God is using that to grow his church. And they're, they're experiencing the love of Christ even though they sent it away. Mm. They're the very ones because you know what? Because of Christ, you have the ability to forgive powerful. You don't find people who are being persecuted that don't really, haven't developed the ability to forgive. They haven't developed it. They just realize that's what's most important. Then I think of another family that we had with our organization working in a very volatile area. Same area as that. And when they had to go, you know, you couldn't even use the roads because there's so many attacks on the roads, different problems. And so we were able to fly them out on a little Cessna to go get some groceries. They flew out. They were going to buy some stuff to go out for a feeding project, put them on a little Cessna plane. The very next day, their entire town was overrun by these Islamic fundamentalists. And you can just say, had they been there, had they been there, God knows these things. That family was safe. Now, I walk through them with this whole process. You know, you would think that that family would say, man, get us, get us back to Texas. <laughs> Get us, to, you know, get us to some other place. You know what my problem was? They keep wanting to go back. They just want to go back. They want to go back because they want to minister to those very people. Today, 
They are doing that. We've opened a community development center. In fact, wells have been done because of this church in that area. In fact, Amen. the town that they were run out of, the only functioning well was a, was a well that, that, Trin that Calvary here paid for. <laughs> I kid you not. You know? And so what you see, though, is a heart to go back because the good news is the good news. And among even the persecuted, their desire is to share it with those who have persecuted them. That's the love of Christ. That is. That, yeah. And that's the power of the gospel the being the gospel. demonstrated through persecution. So, yeah. um, look, persecution is real. It's happening today. And according to Jesus, persecution is a blessing if you're persecuted for him. Now, here's a tough thing. Um, you have to decide whether you're really going to believe Jesus or not. Now, I know most of you in this room and most of you joining us online, most of you at our Parker campus, confess Jesus as Savior. Okay, which means that you've said, I'm going to follow Jesus, which means you've declared him as Lord of your life, which means that you're trusting him. And, and, and we all want God to bless us. Here, here's the difficulty. We want God to bless us the way we want to be blessed. We want God to bless us and give us health, which doesn't really line up with persecution. We want God to give us comfort, which really doesn't line up with persecution. We want God to give us excess. You know, we want stuff. Let's just call it what it is. And um, that doesn't line up with persecution. So, at the same time, we also want the power of God and the presence of God in our lives. And John's already pointed out that those come through the suffering, through the struggle, through the difficulties. And yet, oftentimes when we're facing the difficulties and the struggles, we kind of look at God with accusation and say, why are you letting this happen? Yeah. Instead of saying, we rejoice in our sufferings because suffering produces endurance and endurance produces character and character produces hope. So um, you got to decide, are you going to believe Jesus? Um, yeah, you know, there's one other thing that we haven't mentioned, but, but it's just part of this whole thing. The reason that we can also consider persecution a blessing is because we know that this world is not all that we're hoping for. That's right. See, Jesus died so that we can have life and have it life eternal. That's why he forgave our sins. And so we know that no matter how good or bad it is right now, the best is yet to come. Yeah. And it changes the way that we think about life and it changes the way that we approach difficulty. And so, um, are you, here's a question I want you to struggle with this week. Are you willing to suffer because of Jesus? I'm not wanting you to, but are you willing to suffer because of Jesus? Would you follow Jesus even if it cost you your job? Even if it cost you your scholarship? Even if it cost you your Medicare? They don't, I'm not sure they have Medicare. Uh, no, even if it, wait, even if it cost you your family, if your family said, we're, we're done with you. See, we're not facing persecution yet. But if we did, would you still follow Jesus? Do you agree with Jesus that blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven? Will you pray with me? Father, we love you. And you love us. And sometimes we see that and we praise you for that. And sometimes uh, we're going through things and we question how much you really love us. Even though you said, blessed are those who are persecuted. So God, change our minds. Change the way we think about this world and the things in it. Change uh, the way we approach life and suffering and hardship and difficulty because we are committed to you, no matter what. No matter what we gain, no matter what we lose, no matter whether life is full of joy and celebration or sorrow and grief, we are yours because you have, have redeemed us from hopelessness, from sin, from death, from hell, and you have given us life abundant and life eternal. So let us see that and let us live like we know it. In Jesus' name, amen.